Thanks everyone for attending the 2020 Sunstone Digital Symposium session, the one you've all been waiting for, number 361, titled Plan 10 from Outer Space 25th Anniversary Q&A with Trent Harris and other surprise guests. The audio from this session will be available for purchase at sunstone.org after the symposium. The video recording of this session will be available in the Whova app for the remainder of 2020. At Sunstone, we're making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, there is more than one way to Mormon. So we invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space, especially Plan 10s from outer space, to be better understood. Please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing at sunstone.org. Plan 10 from outer space, described as Nancy Drew on acid, or Rocky Horror meets the, the Mormons, is a science fiction mystery movie based on Mormon history and symbolism. It stars Karen Black and Stephanie Russell. Premiering at Sundance, Plan 10 has become the Mormon cult classic. We, we, we have with us today Trent Harris, who is the director of the film. He is also the director of Reuben and Ed, which he has just informed me is going to be released on Blu-ray next week. Watch for that. The Beaver Trilogy, and he also put out a book called Mondo, Utah, which actually graced the foyer of Sunstone for about 10 years, 10 years of the time that I was there, anyway. Stephanie Russell is a St. Louis-based writer, editor, poet, and actor. She's a co-editor and co-host for the Informal History Zine and podcast, informalhistorystl.org, and a member of Poetry Scores an arts collective dedicated to translating poetry into other media, including visual media, music, film, and food, of course. Her books include 47 incantatory essays, The Possum Codex, and Inferna. She was the Lomier Sculpture Park's 2018 Poet in Residence. And we also have one more person on hand, I am going to, whoops, show you everybody's face. Come back, everyone. Dang it, I was being so professional up until now. Okay, come on, everybody. Pat Collins is also here. For those of you who have watched the, 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 the movie, will you please express how disappointed you are that he shows up without panties on his head? That's true. Come on, we've got an hour. Pat. We have an hour, so. <laughs> okay, Pat. <laughs> So anyway, we're here because everybody who is in this session at the moment uh, has watched this. I, it did say a Mormon cult classic, but I totally disagree. It is the Mormon cult classic. It is like the perfect Mormon movie of all time. We could just stop time right now and we'd be fine. So we have with us Trent Harris, Stephanie Russell, and Pat Collins, and uh, we have a bunch of questions already in the queue, and we already have Andrew Hamilton here, who actually thought of this panel. He said, hey guys, it's the 25th anniversary of the most important Mormon movie ever made. And we said, we should really do something about that. You know, we showed at Sunstone uh, the year that we premiered. So 25 years ago, we had a screening at Sunstone. Let's see, how old was I? I was 20. I was still on my mission. I'm really sorry. I missed it, Trent. It was really fun, yeah. <laughs> what happened? Were there riots? No, no. I, they, they laughed probably harder than any audience I've ever uh, shown it before. I mean, they just, they got jokes that I didn't even get. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, it's, it's a fascinating movie because I'm not positive what your, who your audience was because it had so many Mormon levels, but you obviously made it for a larger audience. Who did you have in mind when you made this movie? I just was trying to make a movie I'd like, <laughs> basically. <laughs> you know, you think that it's just uh, very Mormon-centric, but uh, it actually won the film festival in London. 
you know, they, they gave it the grand prize at the rain dance in London. So it obviously works for people that don't know much about Mormonism also. I was very surprised at that one. I, I, I would have been too. Stephanie, um, did you have a Mormon background when you came into this project? Uh, I mean, I grew up in Salt Lake City, and even if you don't grow up in a strictly Mormon family, or if you're from a Jack Mormon family, I guess, uh, you know, it's, you're still in the larger culture. I mean, I do have family, I have family, like LDS family, but my immediate family, my parents are not Mormon. Um, in fact, I tried to go to a Halloween party with my friends at the ward house and my mother came and dragged me out and I was grounded for two weeks. Wrapped <laughs> <laughs> by the Mormons. <laughs> yeah. Tell them the house, you, whose house you grew up in. Oh, Parley T. Pratt. I grew up in Parley T. Pratt's house. We shot, well, some of it's shot in that house. That's um, right. Yeah. Yeah, up memory grove. So I do have some Mormon cred. <laughs> house. <laughs> And so you had some idea what was going on when you read the script. You weren't like, oh, this guy's been smoking pot. No, no. Actually, I had to ask Trent a bunch of questions. And there were some scenes where he's like, no, you don't understand. To say that <laughs> Joseph Smith is not the prophet, that's like blasphemous. Do you get it? I'm like, oh, OK. I mean, there was some, uh, yeah, I had, I had a, you know, I never went to seminary. So I had some theological uh, learning curve there with the script a little bit what about you pat what sort of background did 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 you bring uh absolutely zero i uh, not mormon um i i mean like what stephanie said you know you know kind of what what it is kind of about so with a guiding hand from trent harris i i quickly became educated well, I thought that you did a pretty good job at entering the soul of the sexually repressed Mormon returned missionary. He was kind of Well, thank you very much. That's nice. <laughs> I hope you were able to shed that just a little bit after the movie was over. Oh, a, a, a titch. I'm still working on it, but I, I think it's going well. <laughs> it stays with you, man. We still have <laughs> sessions about this at Sunstone. <laughs> we're like, how do we get over this? <laughs> I Andrew, think I'll be okay. Bring in your smarts. Ask him a question. All right. I, since uh, Stephen brought up, you know, people's Mormon backgrounds and stuff, I'm a little curious, uh, Trent. Obviously, Mormonism in general uh, influenced the script and the various scenes in the movie. Uh, but I was curious, as you were writing some of these specific scenes and interactions, uh, were they just based on general Mormon experience or were you thinking of specific people or, or people within the church? And, and let me just throw out a couple of things I noticed and maybe you can respond. There's the scene when Larson asked the 14 year old girl to marry him. You know, was there any connection to Joseph Smith marrying a 14 year old, you know, Helen Kimball, um, the shock therapy, you know, there's some things with shock therapy that have gone on in, in Mormonism. A lot of uncle Bob's questions made him sound a little bit like Boyd K. Packer. Were any of these influences going on or was this Mormonism in general that kind of influenced you to write this? It was divine in intervention. I think. But no, you're absolutely right. All of the stuff that you're talking about, I had read quite a bit of, of uh, quotes from Boyd K. Packard. He's easy to use in this, in this movie. Uh, all of the things you said were I was, I was aware of. I mean, really, the, you want to know what the real genesis of this whole thing was. It hit me one day uh, when I, I went down to uh, the Lion House. Uh, and I was looking around the lion house outside in the garden and stuff, and there was a plaque that explained what the lion house was, that it was built by a certain architect. And, uh, but there was no mention of what the lion house was used for at all. There was absolutely zero uh, reference to polygamy, and I thought that was so strange. So I started thinking about all of the things that, this was also right at the time that the, uh, remember those, was it the seven uh, intellectuals that got, um, uh, excommunicated. I can't remember who they even were right now, but it had something to do with that, with that line from Boyd K. Packard, which is, there are many truths, some are uplifting and some are not. 
And so those kind of things really stuck with me and it was uh, quite an easy script to write actually. I imagine so. <laughs> I'm actually, uh, um, yeah, yeah I, 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 I took a tour of, of, the, of, of the Lion House just a couple of years ago and they talked about Brigham Young's office was down here and here's his wife's bedroom. And then we went on. Oh, really? And I was like, they still didn't mention it. <laughs> they still didn't mention it. <laughs> but they were such nice missionaries. I, I wasn't willing to burst no, anything. No, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the way a lot of this is, is going, going to go, those of you who are in our television uh, audience, go to the app, go to the Q&A section, and you'll see that people have already asked questions. You can upvote some of them. I see there have been some upvotes all, already. Feel free to add your own. And uh, we will talk about these things. Yeah, here's an interesting one. How has the Mormon community slash leadership reacted to this film? Was it offended? Or has this state film stayed only on the fringes of the Mormon com community so it doesn't make any waves? You know, I, when this movie premiered at, um, when we showed it here in Salt Lake City at the Tower Theater, it broke box office records. So well, I think we sold 10,000 tickets in a very short time. It was actually the number one film in the country that week per screen average. Of course, it was only on <laughs> one screen. But, you know, the, the, I don't think this movie's anti-Mormon at all. I think that most Mormons that I know look at it and have a great time watching it. The only uh, real... Um, negative feedback I got was when it was shown in Pocatello. They, I know they were outraged in Pocatello at the university. They showed it at the university and there were people picketing and there were, uh, it was just, it was a lot of fun. I loved it. That must have been great. Were you there for it? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of fell in love with the movie too. And I have to be honest and say that I fell in love with the main character. I'm, I'm curious, Stephanie, did, did you receive a lot of proposals from fringe Mormon men when this movie came out? No, but I got uh, reprimanded by a, a guy on a, a mountain bike right by the temple. He, he said, shame on you. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm not Mormon. I, he was really upset at me. Really? He I recognized you from the movie? Yeah, some, I was just walking down the street and this guy verbally accosted me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I was so perplexed. I just stood there and stared at him and, and, and he, he chastised me for 10 or 15 minutes and then he rode off on his bike and I was like, that was weird. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I, for a while there, I got mail from all over the country. It was very strange. But uh, yeah, like some guy in, in, in Alabama, I don't know if they were Mormon guys, but um, no, it, it's cool. I don't know. Uh, the, the chastising was, was probably the most intense. It was actually the, the Mormon rave he was really upset about because he felt like we'd given away too many secrets, I guess. And Trent, I think you said somebody said something kind of recently to you about how dead on that was, the rave. Oh. Yeah, some people, I mean, I, you know, it's the hand signals that got them. The, the, the thing, and I, I didn't realize, I mean, I since realized that there are some certain temple rituals that use hand signals, but I didn't even, I was really referring those hand signals to uh, Masonic hand signals. In fact, I got a book of Masonic hand signals and tried to figure out what they, what they meant. So I, that's what the dance was actually based on. I think some of the temple rituals are also based on some of the Masonic, you know, had Masonic roots. So it was just sort of a serendipity way of getting in there, I guess. <laughs> I was gonna say, I don't remember that part of the temple ceremony when I went to, <laughs> I might've gone more. <laughs> Have you got another question in, in India, Andrew? Yeah, Trent actually just answered one of them. I was going to ask about the, the rave scene and how they kind of choreographed that and came up with it. Um, but I, I do have a question. Through, through a revelation. Exactly. I, I did have a question for Stephanie. I, I like Stephen, I absolutely enjoyed your characterization of Lucinda and had fun watching you in this. Have you been in any other films? Can you tell us a bit more about your 
your poetry and your books and some of the other stuff you're doing now? Oh, well, I should mention uh, Pat and I are working on a, uh, a project with Trent right now called Echo People. As soon as uh, the pandemic is a little less uh, intense, <laughs> we'll go back and finish it. Part one and part two are actually on YouTube um, and you can, and I think uh, Trent, I think you have them linked on your website, right? Um, uh, yeah, I think they are on there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're great fun to watch. So Pat and Stephanie are in that both. Right. So that's, it's a Ruben and Ed spinoff. So there's lots of, if you like Ruben and Ed, there's lots of Ruben and Ed sort of references and uh, yeah, footnotes and stuff. Uh, and then with the poetry, I mean, I don't know, I guess if you sell 2000 poetry books, you're like the Stephen King of poetry. <laughs> it's such a little bitty world. Um, so I have three books. One of them was published locally uh, by a, a, it was printed by a local letterpress uh, company called Firecracker. And, um, and then I have one called the Possum Codex that, uh, I don't know, they're so weird. I, <laughs> most people don't really like poetry that much. I feel like I should be talking more about movies. And then I, I have one that's more like prose poetry that is, you can actually get a copy of it because they printed more than a hundred copies. <laughs> um, and that's called 47 Incantatory Essays and it's uh, really history based and it's very St. Louis-y, but I think just like Plantain is very Salt Lake-y, maybe people could read it even though it's very St. Louis-y and still get something out of it, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think the reason why my character is partly a writer is because that, I mean, that's kind of what I've always been. And so um, I think that's why Lucinda's a writer, maybe, if I remember right. Trent probably remembers better than I do. Yeah, yeah her books are wonderful. They really are. And she's in another movie I made, too, called uh, Welcome to the Rubber Room. And Pat's in that as well. Pat, Pat, Pat the show. Pat has been in every movie, I've, every feature-length movie I've made except for one. He was in Reuben and Ed, he was in Echo, he's been in them all. I always, he's the old go-to go standby when I need a good actor. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and what else have you done with, with, with your career post Plan 10, Pat? Uh, well, uh, Trent Harris, luckily, casting me in many of his movies, and I've done a few others, and I'm a social worker, so there you go. I'm not <laughs> very, good. man, I am not good at this. Okay. He's right. okay. Come on, man, make yourself look interesting. He is interesting. Oh, God. He is interesting. Uh, what was that, Seth? I said you are interesting. Oh, I did his oh. makeup for one scene in Rubber Room. <laughs> so I there we a, go. I, I get a makeup credit, too. It was an honor. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I cast Pat in Welcome to the Rubber Room. I I had this character, uh, what was her name? I can't remember Clover. now. Clover. Clover. Clover, Clover. And I couldn't find any, the right woman to cast. And I thought, well, I'll just put Pat in a dress and cast him. And it worked perfectly. That's my true calling. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the other main character in, in, in the movie, the uh, Deseret Alphabet book, the one that the Pratt guy wrote? Uh, did you find that at Ken Sanders or where did you dig that? I thing made out? that. Oh. <laughs> you mean the Plan 10 from Outer Space book? Yeah. Yeah, no, I made that. You did? Yeah. Yourself? Yeah, yeah. well, me, I with help with, from David Brothers, we just cut it up. Some of the pages and pictures are, you know, they're Xeroxed out of different things and, and some of the, um, we actually made the Deseret Alphabet font for a computer that we could type at the oh time. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was, uh, I, you can find it now. It's not that big of a deal now you can find it. But when we made the movie, we had to actually construct the font, which was an interesting problem. Because if you remember when he's typing on the computer, he's got a program called the Urim and Thummim, which translates the book. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, there's so much, talk about material. There's so much loaded material in Mormonism. So many things that are so interesting that are, you know, when I grew up, I, I grew up Mormon a bit, not a lot, but 
all of my favorite parts of Mormonism were the parts that they didn't want to talk about. I mean, <laughs> I thought Kolob was a fascinating idea. I just a fascinating idea. And the notion of eternal progression and the, and the Deseret alphabet and polygamy and the united order and all of those things I just thought was fascinating. I wish they'd talk more about that in church and less about not smoking and getting married in the temple. <laughs> Yeah, actually, somebody wrote in, your movie is obviously a missionary tool. How many conversions <laughs> to Mormonism have resulted from it? And I'd have to agree with them. I would think, huh, this would be interesting. And then people go into the meetings and they're like, what happened to the fun part? <laughs> what is that? It's a Joseph Smith Sphinx. Somebody actually typed that in. <laughs> is there still an answer or is that just... It's a Joseph Smith thing. All right, all right. <laughs> I'll put up with that. Someone wants to know where you met Karen Black and how you managed to land her. Well, I met Karen. She was played a part in Reuben and Ed, and she became my friend. And she, uh, I was in Salt Lake at the time we were doing Plan 10, and she called me on the phone from L.A., and she said, I heard you're doing a movie. And uh, I said, yeah, but Karen, you got to realize I don't have any money for this. And she says, I don't care. I'll be up there Friday and uh, make sure there's a park for me. And so she was just the most wonderful person. I think Stephanie and Pat would agree with that. She's just so special. It's too bad she's uh, gone off to Kolob now, but because she did die but, uh, recently. But she was just wonderful. So I actually recast the part of Nihor uh, with Karen and, and uh, the one thing she said is that she wanted to make sure that she could sing. She wanted to sing in the movie, so. That was her voice? That was her voice, yeah. And that, you know, we, we changed that song a little bit. If you can hide a cola, who wrote it? Phelps, I think, W.W. Phelps. But that is a psychedelic song. When you listen to the words in that, it is just the trippiest music ever. I heard he was excommunicated. Is that true? Do you guys know? He was, wasn't he? Tell us about it, Andrew. A few times. He was in and out of the church like a half a dozen times. He was a oh, really? interesting fellow, yeah. Well, he sure wrote interesting lyrics. I, my gosh, I thought they, they were great. I noticed you tampered with them, Trent. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. You were talking about how the queens had work left to do, which was kind of a foreshadowing of what was going to happen. That actually brings a, a, a thought to, to, to mind. Someone was asking about the most interesting reaction you, you, you had uh, that people, uh, that someone had to, to this movie. And it makes me think, surely there have been theories spun around this movie, the way they like spin around the shining. So I'm interested in the answer to both questions. What's the most interesting reaction and what are the theories? <laughs> Gosh, I mean, the, just because I made it up doesn't mean it isn't true. That's probably got more mileage than any other line I've ever written. I mean, I hear it's, that one over and over and over again. And it's the uh, slogan for, for, for a particular political party now too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I don't I, yeah, I I don't think you can get a conspiracy theory about conspiracy theories and my movie is kind of a conspiracy theory. So I'm not sure you I mean how many layers can you peel back? I don't know. <laughs> hey, I have a question that's related to one in the comments. Um we all know uh, that Utahns are kind of famously or infamously afraid of nudity so tell me about pulling off pat's nude scene in front of the uh this is the place monument <laughs> i said pat pull your pants down and run over there really quick and he did it <laughs> yeah that was, are you serious that was actually that was actually my first day on the movie that was my first scene he says what's my motivation <laughs> <laughs> if you remember, you weren't completely nude because <laughs> yeah. he was kind of embarrassed. So the front of him, you know, you see his, his uh, ass, but you don't see the front. And we'd actually taken some a piece of cardboard and gaffer taped it around his private parts. <laughs> so, <laughs> which I wish we had a shot of that. That would have been even better. <laughs> the story to that was is because the shot where I turn to 
so you see my oh, rear end. You you said, well, wait, you have to face the camera first and then turn into it. And I was like, what was that now? <laughs> um, okay, I'll be right back. And then I just ran and got duct tape and cardboard. And I wish you had footage of me trying to take it off. That would have been better. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of that was a shot we had to get very quickly, too. Was, yeah, <laughs> right. Nobody's around now. Run. <laughs> that 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 sounds like it answers another one of these questions, which was the most nostalgic memory you have of Plan Ten. So, uh, being nude on set with a cardboard box—that's pretty good. What it what. What about you, Steph Stephanie? What's 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 your favorite nostalgic uh, memory? <laughs> Some of that footage where I'm in the nightgown running down the street. Uh, so Walter, one of our producers, and Trent were shooting that out of the back of a car. So I just looked like this crazy person running down the sidewalk. Uh, and then they hopped out of the car and they were following me with a camera. And my job was to look terrorized and crazy. <laughs> so they're following me down the street. I'm running down, I guess it was Main Street, barefoot uh, in a nightgown. And this nice man walked out of Crossroads Mall, you know, kind of the typical Utah nice guy with the mustache and the glasses and a little bit of avoir du bois. And he's like, are these men following you? Do you need help? <laughs> he tried, he thought I was like escaping, uh, I don't know what, but uh, I, yeah, he came to my, he was trying to rescue me from, from Trent and Walter. <laughs> I was like, it's okay. Thank you, sir. I'm good. <laughs> I'm glad there's somebody out there who would stand up for you. That's great. Oh, yeah. Whoever that guy was, if you're here, if you're out there, <laughs> I appreciate your kindness and sincerity. And then he walked across the street to the temple, went in, put on his white suit and said, you'll never guess what I just saw. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know what was really wonderful too, is it was like the whole community came together to make this movie. I mean, it was just, it was like half the people in Salt Lake are in that movie, I swear. And that was just really fun. People gave us permits to shoot, the state got, gave us all kind of cut, uh, uh, permits to go places and shoot. We didn't have to pay for them. And, and just everybody was in the movie. I mean, there's those scenes that are kind of the crowd scenes downtown when the flying saucer's coming and everybody's running away. And, uh, you know, it was just, it, it just had such a good feeling to it. It was really fun to make. Yeah, I could, I, I could feel that sort of homespun love feeling to it. And then I noticed another guy who went on to fame and glory there, uh, Alex Cal Caldiero. Oh, yeah. Was, 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 was he as nuts then as he is now? No, he's, he's, Alex is one of the best, greatest creatures on this planet. <laughs> he, he is just wonderful. He's been in about four or five of my movies now. He's just wonderful. Uh, I'm helping him. Actually, I'm going to meet with him tomorrow. We're going to do... Uh, it's, I think it's the 60th anniversary of Allen Ginsberg's Howl. And uh, um, every, every five years, uh, Alex has been uh, really conjuring up Ginsberg and doing these incredible performances. So this is the 60th anniversary, and he's, he, we're working together on it. I mean, he's going to do it, but I'm going to help film it and stuff like that. It'll be fun. It'll be in October. I think October 7th is the actual anniversary, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, Alex is great. America, don't self-destruct before o October 7th. Yeah. We need to watch this. Yeah. It'll be streamed live. Uh, uh, you know, if people are interested in that sort of thing, uh, go through Ken Sanders' rare books. He's going to organize the screening, et cetera, et cetera. So it'll be great. That's yeah, great. I heard, I heard Alex uh, read William Blake and Edgar Allan Poe. It was oh. a lot of fun. And his oh. own stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he loves William Blake, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. The guy was insane. So where was the rave scene filmed? Someone says they went to a rave that looked just like that back in the 90s. Did you just sneak into a rave? No. <laughs> no. Uh, but it was filmed in a rave club. What was it called? Play School? Play School, yeah. Play School, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. it was this 
rave club that was this warehouse out on the west side that got closed down quite quickly by the police and and I think they arrested and put the guys in prison even the two of the guys that were running the place but uh, yeah they did some raves there in the ninth and and they were just great again I said we need a space and they said come on down for free and and you know we had to build a lot of sets and things in there so we it took some a lot of time and stuff the sets in that movie I think are quite wonderful and they're all just made out of cardboard really yeah it's all just cardboard and paint so, you know, and our, it, it's really, that's the work of David Brothers. He's just a, a terrific art director and he can, you know, we didn't have any money. So way he just said, well, we can get some cardboard and here's some paint and we can make the spaceship and, and he did it. Was the same thing kind of going on with the costumes? Yeah, everybody, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the talk about a nostalgic moment. I I remember I was just going crazy trying to organize that whole thing, and and they kept uh, the producer came running up to me and says, "How many feathers do the Lamanites have?" <laughs> I uh, three. Well, we only have two. Two. <laughs> Tell us about really the bee costume. The I love theme. the bee head costume thing, or the, the beehive costume. Yeah. yeah. It's like was, iconic. How did that get designed and made? Uh, uh, Chris Hansen made it, who's a local wonderful guy that makes those kind of things. And uh, you know the, how the eyeball moves around inside the head? It was uh, basically a, uh, uh, a little joystick that and it was a parts of a model airplane so he could make it move remotely. Uh -huh. And again, again, it was just the community. I don't even think I had any money to pay him. It was just the community coming together. And I said, I need this beehive head. And he goes, oh, I can do that. Sure, no problem. <laughs> and then the guy that actually carried Stephanie that's dressed up as the beehive is the guy that runs the local uh, grip house here who gave us all of the all of the lighting equipment for free. I mean, just wonderful people. Brian Clifton, Brian Clifton from Redmond Movies and Stories. He's just, yeah, what a good guy. Give us another question, Andrew. You had a bunch of them. I actually kind of want to hear about everybody's favorite scene in the film from Stephanie and Pat and Trent. Did you have a particular scene or, or part of the film that was your favorite? Go ahead, you guys. I'm tired of hearing from um, you guys speak. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, my probably my favorite scene is probably the rave. Uh, that's one of my favorite scenes, and the scene with Karen Black, just simply because it's I have a scene with Karen Black. <laughs> the rave was amazing. I loved the uh, the uh, pregnant uh, pioneers, the cage dancing pioneer woman. Oh my gosh. There was a lot of nuts so stuff in there. Did those people like come up with it themselves or were you like, let's get this person and this person and you? Well, you know, again, it was the dancers, I think was at Ryrie Woodbury. Mm -hmm. And oh. a, a lot of, I think it was, well, they were mixed up. Some of them were from the university, some of them were, but they're professional dancers. And again, they came in and said, yeah, we can do that. No problem. And I had them, you know, I gave them the hand signals and then I said, can you choreograph this? And, and uh, Hillary Carrier and, and uh, oh, Janet. Uh, Janet. Uh, Janet, yeah, did the choreography. Uh, everybody kind of just brought their own costumes and we all kind of knew what we were trying to do. The the go-go cage is just made out of PVC pipe, you know, <laughs> stuff, stuff like that. I think my favorite scene is when Karen sings, uh, If You Could Hide a Colob. That's the one that I just, I love the way that works, you know, cutting between Stephanie and her dream and the, her singing and the motorcycle and all that stuff. I thought I did, that, that to me is my favorite scene probably. I also want to, I love that felt board scene. I thought that was <laughs> with the little Sunday school cutouts. Actually, we had to cut all the wings off the angels because Mormon angels don't have wings. In fact, I think I cut a few off. <laughs> I'm going to hell for this, Sniff. But, uh, that, you know, that it sounds kind of funny, but that whole sequence, I mean, I, I you know, I'm a little bit fuzzy around the edges. You know, I get ver verklempt easily. But that sometimes moves me to tears. I'm like, oh, my God, that's so beautiful. And it is like just the whole uh, 
medium that Trent used for that. It's kind of genius, you know, because everyone recognizes those little felt guys, right? If you go to church and using them for this really uh, irreverent end, I thought was really genius. And it's the voiceover and, and, and it's funny too. It like gets you, me, well, it gets me choked up, but it makes me laugh. And it's, yeah. And that's often like that scene gets some of the biggest laughs in the film that flaming arrow that says bad music on it <laughs> that makes everybody laugh every time so i love all the scenes those guys mentioned but i love that one in particular too i've got to watch it again i haven't seen it for a long time oh come on i watched it twice in the past week <laughs> you got to catch up with me oh yeah i had a screening that this is weird it screened in bucharest Go figure. I got a call from a gallery in Bucharest who wanted to do a show called Mondo Utah. And, and, and so they posted all of this kind of strange Mondo Utah stuff and showed Plan 10 from outer space. People in Bucharest are interested in Utah? I don't know if anybody even went to the screen. <laughs> but the gallery was certainly into it. They really did it. It's funny. So you it's wrote a book called Mondo oh, Utah. Was it based on your book? Yes, actually. I mean, that, a lot of it was, yeah. And then they thought, well, I mean, the perfect companion piece to Mondo, Utah is Plan 10 from Outer Space. If you've got those two things, you pretty much understand Utah. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of the, the history that the historical society would rather forget. Yeah, we like to talk about it here, though. That's why we brought everybody. <laughs> I'm curious if, uh, if, if, if Plan 10, besides... Uh, uh, interviews at Sunstone and Bucharest, if it's haunted, you three, either it's Mormonness or it's weirdness, or if it gets into your dreams or if people recognize you like years af after the fact, is it still haunting you? Pat, are you still um, wear uh, panties on your head or? Only on, uh, only for weddings and funerals. But <laughs> uh, I got, I did get a, a free ticket into Bruvies one time because the guy recognized me <laughs> from it. So there you go. There, uh, the, 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 kiss of, the, the kiss of famousness, I guess. That's a weird thing. Um, I was at Burning Man, actually not to go, but to cover it. it was, Trent was there that year too. And there was this giant snail shell thing out in the desert. And I was at the littlest point of the snail shell walking out and my voice, you know, it would amplify everything. And so my voice was booming out of the other side of the snail shell, I guess. And I came out and this woman says to me, you were in Plan 10 from outer space. And I was like, how did you know that? And she's like, I recognize your voice. We have Karen Black on our answering machine. It's a snip from that movie. They were in Los Angeles. It was the weirdest damn thing, probably, well, not the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me, but definitely in the top 10. Ask us another question, Andrew. You're good at it. Um, I'm curious, Trent. I mean, obviously, there's the whole Mormon influence going on, but what else influenced you when you made this film? You know, or were there certain filmmakers, or was there a certain look you were going for? What, what, what were kind of your inspirations as you put together the look and feel of the film? Did you choose certain lighting or film stocks, or you know, what, what was kind of your influences as you put the movie together? Well, most of the film was donated and given to me. So it's shot on about 20 different film stocks. But uh, I remember talking to the uh, cameraman and the art director early on, and we decided to go for like, you know, since it's kind of comic book colors. So it's very primary, you know, reds, blues, yellows, greens, very bright kind of, same kind of ink that you would use in a comic book, sort of. And so we, we you know, and we went for that kind of a look. And, and then also the low, you know, we decided since there isn't any money in this or to create the sets and things like that, let, let's go for a low budget look. Let's make it look like, like it's handmade, you know, don't try to fool people like, uh, that. It, you know, that this is really a spaceship or something, you know, it's, uh, with all of the CGI and everything that they're doing now, this handmade feel, I think, 
feels good. Great. That's what it does. Yeah, it just it has a different feeling to it. That's um, it's more human. It's warmer somehow. That was basically it. And then, you know, also working with these two people here are very inspiring because they each have certain kind of. Uh, well, they are kind of like the people that I cast. I mean, they, Stephanie is kind of like Lucinda, and Pat is really like Larson Larson. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, were, were, were there any of the things that you connected to Mormonism in the movie that weren't actually Mormonism, or did you stick with real Mormon stuff? I think it just stuck to real Mormon stuff, didn't we? I can't remember anything that wasn't, that didn't come out of there somehow. I mean, like you mentioned, the aversion therapy was kind of a very big deal at that time. And uh, a lot of that stuff was pulled right out of the newspaper. The, even the panties on the head thing where there was, I got out of the newspaper. There was a, a missionary that had been arrested for stealing panties. And I got that out of the Salt Lake Tribune. So I thought, well, I better call Pat right away. <laughs> <laughs> In relation to that, so when I love the line uh, when Mormon Talmadge uh, is kind of telling his story when he says he went up into the mountains to pray and he filled his hat with rocks. I actually knew a guy that when he wanted to get more spiritual and whatever would walk up into the mountains and carry big heavy rocks around so i wondered did, did you know somebody or hear about somebody putting rocks in their hat or where did that come from well i heard that joseph smith put rocks in his hat the seer stones and looked into his hat so that's where that came from i'm not smart enough to make this stuff up i just <laughs> i mean that's where i got that i, I can't remember isn't that right am i mis isn't that part You're of the right yeah <laughs> You're, I guess I was thinking more of the, you know, the people that would whip themselves and punish themselves oh. rather than looking into it. I, I misunderstood the reference then, so that's my fault. Yeah, I think it was, it's the seer stones, and he sees Karen Black there, you know, he say, or Nihor, Nihor, which I can't oh. remember, I cannot remember how, who, who is Nihor in the Book of Mormon? I can't remember, it was a bad king or something like that? I can't remember exactly. Do you guys know? You gotta know, you're Mormon scholars. Yeah, he's one of the bad guys in the Book of Mormon. He's like a gangster uh, that goes around killing people and causing problems. Right, uh, yeah. I I'm curious, the, the neighbor, did Lucinda have a crush on the neighbor? <laughs> Guy. Steve, uh, yeah, he was, yeah, he was a, you mean, oh, for in the movie, or he was a sweet guy. We hung out a little bit, actually. Super, super, super sweet guy. I cannot say enough good things about Deva. I mean, I think she did. Don't you think, Trent? I mean, sure. <laughs> I wonder what happened to him. I really miss him. I haven't seen him for years and years and years. He just kind of vanished. Maybe he got sucked up by a spaceship or something. I don't know. Did, he, did the actor just kind of make up that dance move that he did? Or did you choreograph yeah. that? How did that come about? He, he was he did a lot of kundalini yoga, so he was like super twisty, flexy, like, you know, he, he was a limber guy and he, he kind of uh, freestyled it, as I remember. Yeah, I mean, there's that scene where he answers the telephone. Yeah. And, he, you know, I mean, it's the simplest scene in the world. It's like, go answer the phone and he's... He did it differently every time, if I remember. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's great. Someone it's, is. It's funny how actors can add little things that I'd never in a million years think of, like him doing that thing to go answer the phone. And it, the, the thing that's really fun about the th I'll tell you the way to make a good movie is you hire people that know more than you do. You know, like I, I don't have to tell Stephanie how to act because she knows more about it or Pat. And, and so you hire people that know a lot more than you do and then kind of get out of the way and let them do their thing works i think that's the best way to do it so somebody just 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 responded to your uh thing about you just pulled things out of the newspaper was the hospital patient story about having sex with angels borrowed from scott carrier well, there you go yeah it was it was that's right bernadette 
That's right. Scott had done a thing about it. That's exactly right. Scott, well, Scott was helping with the sound on Plan 10 from Outer Space. He did a lot of the sound work. So, it, yeah, I'd forgotten that, but that's true. That's where that did come from. Interesting. He'd done a radio story about that, I think. Oh, so it wasn't Scott Carrier who was having sex with angels. He was covering the story. Okay. <laughs> I misunderstood that part. I thought he had a much more interesting life. <laughs> well, he might have been. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, somebody's asking, this is actually the most popular question on the entire board. If a long lost aunt gave you $10 million to make a sequel to Plan 10, what would the story be about? Hmm. Well, that's kind of a tough question. I'm going to have to think about that one for a minute. I'm okay. Sure. Well, you know what would be interesting is to pick it up where women are in charge. Karen, you know, take it, just go on with the film where Karen Black is in charge of the, of uh, everything. In charge of, I mean, that's kind of a wonderful moment when she uh, shoots the Brigham Young statue and it disappears and she says, women are in charge. Uh, that would be interesting to take it from there and see if if women being in charge actually is a good thing. I don't. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, according to the movie, everything got destroyed, right? And we had to bury our double-sided density discs <laughs> in the earth. Well, like, to be dug up later. Oh, that's you know. true. And then they could. Oh, there you go. And then you open up the double-sided density, and it starts a new religion. Uh, this is great. That's okay, we're ready. That's not bad. That's not bad. That could work. Long lost ant, come out of hiding. <laughs> yeah, actually, somebody said, I think the best thing about the film is the matriarchal takeover. Do you <laughs> think the women are going to take over the world? <laughs> I wish. I wish. Stephanie, would you start things for us, please? Sure. Yeah, we'll look at New Zealand. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. All right, take us away, Andrew. We have 10 minutes left. I'm actually curious, I mean, about the rest of your uh, your cast. Where I, I mean, your cast was just so great. I loved everybody from the little old ladies taking pictures to well, that was dad at the mom. hospital. Oh. That was your mom. <laughs> was my mom, yeah. <laughs> so did you just kind of go around asking everybody you knew to be in the movie, or how did you kind of collect the various cast members? That's basically it, uh, you know, just grabbing people off the street sometimes. But yeah, so, and I try to cast my mother in as many things as I possibly can. Uh, but yeah, they were basically, they were all friends, weren't they? I can't think of any strangers that we hired. Hired, that's a good way to put it, that worked on the movie. <laughs> I mean, Curtis and... Yeah, everybody, I, we pretty much knew everybody. It was just, you know, let's put on a show. So we all got together. <laughs> let's make a movie. It, 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 it kind of had the feel of, of, of a Mormon road show back when those yeah. were a thing. <laughs> I think so, yeah. In all the best ways, of course. <laughs> it would be a fun Mormon road show, wouldn't it? Do they we still do it? Next year at the symposium, we're, if we can get together in person, we're going to do a roadshow version of Plan 10. Oh, that'd be great. Wouldn't Are you that? ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> Trent Harris will be there. You got any more thoughts inside your head, Andrew? Um, I'm a little curious. Stephanie kind of answered this earlier, but you, know, you mentioned growing up in Salt Lake, but not really... Yeah, you know, oh, in around Mormonism, but not of Mormonism or whatever. But you nailed the like Mormon laurel, you know, look the the Mormon young women look and behavior so well. Did you do any research? Go to church for a couple of weeks, try and pick up a vibe, or, or tell us how you kind of prepared for the role. Oh, I don't know. I guess that part came naturally. I I didn't go to church, not that I remember anyway. Uh, well, Trent, you kind of. I mean, I think it was sort of a group process. You mean with the costumes and stuff? And, and yeah, that was, just with the look and the whole kind of behavior, the way she she kind of acts and reacts to men and behaves. It just, I, I thought it was so spot on. I just assumed you maybe grew up in the church or something. I was curious. Well, I guess I, uh, I don't know how that happened. I come by it honestly. <laughs> I don't know. 
uh, the, well, the, uh, the costuming, actually, we had kind of fun with that. We went vintage clothes shopping, and Trent actually was pulling some stuff off the racks, like those big poofy dresses. And um, so that, I mean, that was just kind of us picking out fun stuff. I think actually that comic book aesthetic that Trent was talking about earlier, I think that kind of played into it too, but I'm glad I nailed it. I think, I think I'm just sort of naturally prudish. <laughs> he, he, he found the right non-Mormon Mormon girl, I guess. <laughs> Did you scour Desert Industries for costumes and, and yes. things? <laughs> well, we had to go to Desert Industries. I mean, how could you not go to DI? I mean, DI had to have some kind of cameo. I mean, if it's Salt Lake, you can't not have DI in some in some way. Actually, we've gone to DI for other films too. DI, DI is like, yeah. It's, like the, I, be it's the best prop store in the country. Yeah. So Trent, since you wrote the the the, the movie, was there a, was it a metaphor for anything? Say that again. Was it a metaphor for anything? My, my movie. Yeah. A metaphor? No, it's it's pretty much on the surface. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. You know, you can. Yeah, scrape beneath the tinsel to find the real tinsel, but I don't know. I think <laughs> I think I have a theory, just to let oh, you know. Oh well good. I think your subconscious was doing something and you just didn't know it. Well, yeah, I mean that's always the case. <laughs> <laughs> because I noticed that um that as Lucinda goes on this journey, all of the men she talks to are connected with theology and doctrine and power. And all of the women she talks to are connected with the body. Ah. So then when she's sitting in the, uh, in, in the history li li library, when you're look looking at her typing, then behind her are three men in suits putting their hands on the girl's head as she's sitting there. And, uh, and I'm thinking that what this is is that it's Boyd K. Packer's nightmare <laughs> funneled through you. I so hope this so. is what happened. This, it, 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 it was showing how a woman connects with both her body and power through the uh, institution. So she, all the men, she has to gather all of the knowledge. And then once she has all of it, then she goes into the rave and now that she has all, 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 all that knowledge, she's able to perform sort of the incantation to finally bring her full femininity to the earth. And of course, it destroys Salt Lake City because it's a patriarchal structure. That's and so, incredible. That's exactly it all makes what I'm sense. thinking. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, it does. You should write a paper on that. That was beautiful. <laughs> Agreed. Huh. I was I'm sure that you had that in mind. What's 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 that, Pat? Oh, I just said I'm in awe of that. That sounds that that's great. I know. It. Isn't that what I told you guys this was about when we were to making it? <laughs> exact those words exactly. Yes. <laughs> All right. Andrew, do you have any more thoughts? No, I think I'm about out. It's been a fun panel. <laughs> You're out of thoughts. <laughs> it's been a long sunstone. <laughs> it's true. We're at the tail end of a four-day uh, conference, and is today the last day. Pooped. Yeah, this is the last day. Although I am a little curious. Tell us a little bit more about the Salt Lake, the, the Lake Lake scene when you out with all the the. Uh, I want to say pigeons, but that's the wrong bird. The, oh. the seagulls and the poop and everything. I, I'd love to hear about any adventures or fun stories from that. I mean, the, the other actress, the cousin or whatever, she's like, I'm getting pooped on. Tell us a little bit more about that and, and that scene shooting that. That was an incredible location, wasn't it? I mean, I found this rock with where there was a seagull rookery and I thought, God, we got to shoot a scene here. This is incredible. And we walked out there on those rocks and the seagulls didn't leave. They stayed there, didn't they? They just stayed there. They, they didn't, I, I was afraid they'd all fly away. The, the kind of the horrific 
part for me was that we'd step on eggs every once in a while and we were trying to film and I was like, ah, oh, I didn't want to do yeah. that. But yeah, that's an amazing, I, I, there, there's another scene that I think is a great scene. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that on film before. Well, maybe, maybe the birds, after Hitchcock's the birds, but. Those were fake birds, right? Yeah, this was much more intense. Mm -hmm. And it's so pretty when she's out there and she finds the plaque of Kolob is just beautiful too, I think. Uh oh, I'm getting a call. <laughs> I'm glad you have friends, Trent. This is great. That's the first time, first phone that's rang in a month around here. <laughs> well, Pat and Stephanie, do you have any parting words for us? Oh, just thank you. I'm like super honored to be part of a Sunstone panel. You guys do such amazing work and um, so yeah, I'm just honored to <laughs> to be here with you guys. Thanks for doing this. I was thrilled that you could come. So thrilled. And maybe we'll have you back again next year so that you can play a part in the road show, right? Right? <laughs> this is going to be amazing. And Pat, I'll, please. So I'll do the, road, do the road show as long as you cut out certain scenes. Um, <laughs> the card so, or duct tape part. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that. Uh, thanks. Thanks for asking me. It was great. It was Super fun to reminisce you know, once again about Plan 10. It's a fantastic move movie. It's 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 one of my favorites. I've got to say, it's it's the perfect movie and the perfect Mormon movie, which makes me like it even more. So Trent, tell us, tell all of our viewers here here today how they can watch Plan 10. Oh. Well, um, and go to my website if you just google Trent Harris films um, my website will come up and you can, you can find it there. You can also find the echo people there too. Just Google Trent Harris films. It's really at echocave.net is where it is. So you can find the, you can find all my movies there. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them. You can find a lot of my films there. And, and is the, uh, is, is the high heel shoe from Ruben and Ed still available for $25,000? I sold it. I sold that. I, <laughs> I sold lost that. my chance. I sold that, I sold the cap, I sold the clapper board. That's how I financed the other movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, are there any artifacts left from Plan 10? Uh, there's some- They were all cardboard, that's right. Yeah, there's not much. I did have uh, the bee head for a while, but somebody made it off with that, which is unfortunate. I, I, did, find my, I did find my original script the other day. Oh, really? Yeah, I yeah printed on. Print it on the dot matrix kind of right. paper. It was, yeah. I've got, I, I do have the plaque of Kolob still, too. I've got that. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, the Church History Museum's got a, a copy of that, of the plaque of Kolob. When the movie came out, they somebody from the museum uh, contacted me and said, oh, we'd just love to have one of those. And so, <laughs> I said, great. Here's another alternative fu future. <laughs> Some future Mormons find the plaque of Kolob in the ruins of the church office building. <laughs> it would be wonderful. <laughs> well, we've reached our time. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. Andrew, thank you so much for remembering that it's the 25th anniversary of the Mormon cult classic. Stephanie, thank you for coming and letting me hear your voice. And <laughs> Phil... Thank you for, oh, you never brought the panties. I'm not thanking you anymore. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and Trent, thank you for making such a weird movie. And you've made other weird movies too. Everybody who's watching this should buy all of his movies and then buy the movies for your friends and neighbors as well. Yeah, that's so a that, good uh, idea. So that Trent can finally get rich and famous. Or I can find <laughs> another movie. Yeah, even better. <laughs> all right, I'm going to let you all go. All Thanks right. again for joining us. We'll catch See you, you later. later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you.